Welcome to Classic Rock Fans, one of my top 10 or 10 of the best videos, so to speak. And today we're looking at the 10 best studio albums by Frank Zappa. Do bear in mind these are just my 10 personal favourites and your opinion may well differ from mine. If you're new to this channel, be sure to click like, subscribe and check that bell to get notified of any future uploads. And do check some of the links below this video for ways you can support the work done here at Classic Album Review. is always much appreciated. Number 10 is You Are What You Is from 1981. Zappa, busy at the Utility Muffin Research Centre, produced this gem of an album. It's one of Zappa's more accessible albums, I think, aimed at a, uh, perhaps primarily a rock audience. Uh, DJs refused to play it due to its lewdness and uh, what they perceived as its political content. Of course, Zappa seems to begin with uh, a song that seems to be directed against the audience that this album is perhaps trying to appeal to with the song Teenage Wind, which has that endless chorus of we want to be free, free as the wind. And it starts with that whiny teen voice opining that no one would give him a ride to the Grateful Dead concert. And the repetitions in these songs seem rather colourless. Perhaps Zappa's scathing attack on meaningless adolescent aspirations. On this record we get the wonderful Jimmy Carl Black, uh, reminiscent of 200 Motels of course. And also employs that wonderful country aesthetic on Harder Than Your Husband. Doreen is another interested sort of perverted doo-wop number. And Goblin Girl joins the ranks of Jewish Princess, Catholic Girls and Motherly Love. And theme for the third movement of Sinister Footwear is actually a guitar piece that was actually a third movement of uh, one of Zappa's ballets. Doesn't get any more bizarre than this. Well actually it does, and probably on numerous albums that actually don't make my list. Number nine is Joe's Garage from 1979. This is one of the first Zappa albums I ever bought. It was originally released as a single album in, uh, I think it was uh, September 1979, followed by the double album Acts 2 and 3, uh, which hit the shelves two months later. This three-part opera that dabbles in some pretty dystopian themes was actually released as a, uh, a full-on box set, I think, in 1987. Um, and the story is narrated by a government employee known as the Central Scrutinizer. Resonates with uh, audiences today, I think. The narrative concerns a rather unremarkable adolescent who starts a band in Los Angeles. It loses his girlfriend to the debaucheries of the tour bus. And lyrical themes touch upon uh, you know, adolescent sexuality and the danger of big government. It's a cautionary tale built around a central conceit that is a young man forming a rock band in an age where music is outlawed. And this gives Zappa the platform to talk about free expression and individualism, and therefore speaks very prophetically of the state we kind of find ourselves in these days. Of course, the central scrutinizer warns us that music is a slippery slope, leading to uh, drug use, disease, unusual sexual practices, prison, and eventual insanity. And Joe, who has a few fruitless encounters during the narratives unfolding, has a few minor mishaps, usually involving an unguarded urethra, all adding to the comedic thrust of this record. The lyrics offer a humorous commentary on American society and he critiques government and religion. Nothing new there from Zappa. I love the in-between track commentary of the central scrutinizer, you know, with its fluffs and blunders which feeds into that atmosphere of dishevelment, adding to the comedic feel of the narrative. Also we're introduced on this record, um, the singer Ike Willis, whose wonderful voice defines the later Zappa period. Very much in the same way that uh, Ray Collins defined the music of the Mothers of Invention um, in the beginning. This is a, a great record which includes the controversial Catholic Girls, which was kind of Zappa's riposte to criticisms of anti-Semitism after a Jewish princess featured on the, I think, Shake Your Booty album. Number eight is Absolutely Free from 1967. This is a challenging record, more so than the debut album. It's a record divided between two suites, with Zappa demonstrating his interest in the avant-garde, the use of tape splicings, and particularly uh, music concrete. Uh, the interests and emulations of Varese and Stravinsky, Stravinsky are still very, very much apparent here. It all mingles in the super dissonant textures and uh, sonic explorations. You know, as well as, uh, you know, you get a melange of spoken word and atonal vocalizations. Uh, Richard Berry's immortal Lue Lue is, is used on this as a, a remarkable platform in which Zappa explores the repressions of straight America. Zappa takes rock and roll and forms a cultural manifesto on this one. It's now that it's a troubled polemic on the juxtaposition between uh, conservatism and America's changing values. 
and it beautifully evokes uh, an atmosphere of outrage in, in many cases. I particularly like Invocation and a Ritual Dance for Young Pumpkin, uh, which was Zappa's first extended guitar workout. Of course, we get whole albums of those later on. And this whole album moves along like a cacophonous collage, and Zappa continues his attack on uh, platforming his rage against fakery and hypocrisy. With much of the music on here ironically forming a formless parody of the formlessness of psychedelia. And much more so of course on the uh, album we're only in it for the money. Ray Collins in his book states that this is the best early Zappa album. Unlike the first Zappa album, uh, Zappa displays his wonderful ability for mimicry and a musical pastiche. And we get narratives like the uh, Duke of Prunes. In fact, one commentator said the uh, this track in particular was the start of progressive rock. Not sure I agree with that though. But it's one of my favourite suites on this album, this gaggle of voices and strange, strange interjections. Anyway, this is a great, great album. There was a wonderful review of this album on my Patreon. Uh, do consider signing up and checking it out. Number seven, we're only in it for the money from 1968. This wonderful sonic collard wrapped in this pepper parody sleeve. And from that opening belt, which very much sets the tone for the proceedings, I think we get the feeling we're in for something special with this one. It's a typical Zappa mishmash of music concrete, bizarre musings, as well as the stuttering inarticulations of the hippie subculture. At the height of flower power, when according to Ben Watson, when Allen Ginsberg's combination of Never Never Nirvana and Lust for Youth Erotics had been embraced by the Beatles and editors of rock magazines all over the world, Zappa launched a barrage of objections. Zappa was fairly disparaging of bands like uh, Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead, perhaps uh, I think at least implicitly accusing them of, uh, of fakery. And he certainly had no love for the Velvet Underground and the whole New York art scene either. The song Who Needs the Peace Corps runs through this uh, litany of uh, counterculture uh, luminaries, namely uh, Alzi Stanley, the Psychedelic Dungeons, Bill Graham's celebrated venue, the Fillmore, of course. It's quite easy to view Zappa's opinion of the hippies as rather grouchy and mean-spirited, but I think you know, it was a criticism of the blinkered, narcotized world it represented. You get numbers like Concentration Moon, where he made warnings about uh, internment camps. Richard Nixon was readying for nonconformists. The line in the song says, drag a few freaks away in a bus. You know, it's a chilling premonition of how establishment uh, forces could very much kick back against the anti-war movement. Uh, this was pre-Ohio as well. The cops, they shot some girls and boys, he sings. In the sleeve notes, interesting, Zappa invites us to read the, uh, the Penal Connolly, a short story by Franz Kafka, as he feels it's perhaps uh, pertinent to what was culturally going on in America at the time. The chrome-plated megaphone of destiny. What a wonderful, wonderful title. It's a sonic montage designed, I think, to out to George Martin's uh, uh, like crescendo ending to a day in the life. I'm talking of the Pepper parody sleeve. The, uh, the sleeve, like the original one, features numerous luminaries, including, uh, including Zappa's wife, Gail, who was pregnant with Moon Unit at the time. Interestingly, MGM's lawyers insisted that anyone who was still alive on that sleeve had a, a black bar across their eyes, of course making the whole album sleeves even, even more sinister. Number six is Overnight Sensation from 1973, one of my favourite, favourite Zappa albums. It's a glorious cacophony of lewdness and crazy in equal measure. Um, Zappa said, it, the sonority of it is so strange. Let's not forget this album sees the adding of uh, Ruth and Ian Underwood uh, to the mother's ranks. This album boasts I'm the Slime, of course, which is uh, Zappa's uh, acerbic attack on the, the uh, influence of, of TV and media, which he definitely saw as a cultural blight. He sings, you do as you're told until the rights to you are sold, all in the tones and solemnity of a voiceover. Uh, Camillo Brillo takes aim at the uh, counterculture and the hippie mama who buys her alternative clothing from Sears and Roebuck. Montana is an interesting one, who was actually inspired by a, a real life incident. Um, Zappa glanced at a box of dental floss and, and the resulting epiphany was that he needed to incorporate more everyday things, everyday experiences into his music. I love the line, Zircon encrusted tweezers. Zappa went on to explain that uh, in a radio interview that this symbolised fake grandeur that might be sexually stimulating. 
And talking of sexually stimulating, we get Dynamo Hum on this one with the, the cameo from uh, Tina Turner and the Icats. 50-50 and Zombie Wolf, we are treated to the wonderful, wonderful voice of uh, Ricky Lancelotte. That hoarse, demented uh, vocalizations uh, are just remarkable, especially when combined with the electric violin and organ sound. It gives the whole thing a, a frenzied, belly constrained feel. Described by one critic as a uh, high-tech version of uh, low-down R&B. Dirty Love is a, a great number as well. It was the apparently the climax of Zappa's rewriting of Genesis uh, into a parable of poodles, a sleazy, intoned jazz rock version of the Stooges I Want to Be Your Dog. On this album, it seems that Zappa takes aim at some of the progressive tendencies emerging in Europe, seeing, you know, feeling that music can be complex without being... Uh, um, juiceless or spiritually pretentious. We have to wonder whether he was gazing across topographic oceans at the time. Number five is Apostrophe from 1974. Some critics have argued this album is a critique of commercialism uh, and how people are effectively manipulated. You know, this is certainly one of Zappa's most accessible albums, it has to be said, as well as being deceptively clever, which you could say that about a vast majority of his material. Uh, you know, his lyrics are full of puns and intricate twists and turns. It's also one of his silliest productions, which immediately recommends it to me. Full of jokes and ludicrous topics, all delivered in this very facetious manner. Interestingly, Ben Watson argues that uh, in his book, Frank Zappa, the negative dialects of poodle play, suggests that Zappa on this album was unconsciously, perhaps, influenced by Plato's Phaedo and uh, Shakespeare's King Lear in, term, in, in respect that the album deals with issues such, such as existence and non-existence. Uh, it feels like a bit of a reach to me, but... Nevertheless, Poodles do make an appearance on this album, like they do an overnight sensation. Uh, do they have a profound significance? I sometimes think uh, it's a silly name for a silly-looking dog. Maybe it's got that visual appeal for Zappa. Nevertheless, on stage in 73, I believe it was, Zappa abused stuffed Poodles on stage and alluded to the stupidity of the spectators suggesting there was something poodle-like in his audience. In fact, he told NME, poodles serve as a convenient mechanism for conveying certain philosophical ideas that might otherwise be more difficult. And why not an album that's full of wise and philosophical gems like Nanook's mother's advice, uh, uh, watch out where the huskies go and don't you eat that yellow snow delivered like an advertising slogan. Watson goes on to say in his book, Zapper understands adverts as the dream time of the rational capitalist order and plunders them for Dadaist dysfunctionalism. Stinkfoot is a, a great number, almost like a commercial for a foot spray. It reminds me a little bit of the Who Sells Out. Zapper's relationship with the notion of the commercial was uneasy, often descending into satire and sarcasm and musical grotesques. There's certainly nothing new there. He's been doing that for since the inaugural Zapper and the Mothers album. And it's understandable why this album is so popular, all its lewd and scatological uh, references, all wrapped up in the, an interesting critique of modernist nihilism at the shallowness of our very existences. For me, this is a perfect introduction to Zappa, this record, uh, for anyone who had not actually heard a Zappa album. Um, I think I think it'd just been beamed down from some planet somewhere. Cosmic Debris is a, a great one as well. It's him um, taking aim at certain counterculture gurus, those that sought to capitalise on the poodlesque tendencies in us all. Maybe Frank was on to something. Number four is Freak Out from 1966. This album is a powerful opening statement, there's no doubt about that. And let's face it, 1966 was a pretty seismic year for music. We had uh, Blonde on Blonde, Pet Sounds and Revolver. And as we said, that the Beatles were aware of this album, and McCartney in particular was um, uh, very influenced by it. And on this record, we get a whole blend of influences and kaleidoscopic sounds, sneering parody, and vaudevillian bawdiness. It's a wake-up call for American youth as they're constantly bludgeoned with musical mayhem. One critic has described this record as injecting a viral dose of intelligence, realism, and, and antagonism into pop. You get this wonderful critique of freak culture pains to groupies in motherly love, as well as the, the one that didn't make the album that was left off it, um, a groupy gangbang, of course. And the overall concept of the album has been described by Zappa as overall satirical. And this is the album that introduces us to Susie Cream Cheese, who informs us that the, the band are crazy and they smell bad. This is a seminal album in uh, rock and roll history, as far as I'm concerned. 
uh, not beloved by everybody of course the LA, the LA Times describe it as uh, musical gibberish but you can't please everybody can you the first part of the album uh, tends to be musical motifs and pastiches including uh, the Rolling Stones satisfaction in uh, Hungry Freak's Daddy the Birds Eight Miles High Ain't Got No Heart and it questions of course that burgeoning subculture and freak scene the second side is far more avant-garde and uh, experimental. Zappa, of course, was incorporating his love of Varese and Stravinsky, especially on this record, especially on the first two or three albums, I think, and describing his guitar solos as air sculptures. Apparently, Zappa was never a fan of LSD, but the rest of the band made up for it in bouts of lysergic debauchery. McCartney lists this album as an influence, as I've said, as it deconstructs pop culture in one, one fell swoop. In fact, one critic has described this album as a, a dialogue between rock and the changing experience of modernity in modern America. Hungry Freaks is one of the standout tracks on this album, which dissolves into like a musical splurge. Ain't Got No Heart has Ray, Ray Collins sound like a parody of Jim Morrison. Of course, the Doors weren't particularly well known at this point, but they certainly were known and they were around. So I don't know, maybe that's just a bit of a reach on my part. And who are the brain police? Zappers owe to the authoritarian notion of um, thought control, uh, how pertinent that is today. It also includes some interesting experimentation with editing. Zappa was really interested in William Burroughs, of course, and that splicing techniques he used to use. Uh, he was out to rattle his audience, there was no doubt about that. He constantly wanted us to question uh, everything, including the validity of his own art. So this album, I personally feel, has to make everybody's top ten. Number three is Shake Your Booty from 1979. This is the first album to be released on Zappa's own eponymous label uh, after he departed from Warner Brothers, I think it was. It's one of his more accessible albums uh, as well, and it's one of those that I would definitely recommend as an introduction to Zappa. It's one of my personal favourites. Rather than all that avant-garde jazz fusion, it offers us a lewd aesthetic experience. We get absolutely wonderful guitar work on this, uh, musical satire, and as I've said, lewdness to boot. The title is actually a pun on the Casey and the Sunshine band. Uh, they had a hit single with Shake Your Booty. And uh, also interestingly enough, the opening number I Have Been In You is a uh, kind of a musical riposte or pastiche, shall we say, of the um, Peter Frampton number, which was a huge hit. I'm In You, I think it was called. But nevertheless, as an opening track, it certainly sets the tone for this album. You get guitarist Adrian Bilou, on this who is absolutely immense especially his uh, uh his voice parody of dylan in the track flakes where we help helpfully inform that we must never flush a tampoon this is obviously before his work with robert fripp and king crimson broken hearts for arseholes is another standout number with uh zappers uh paying tribute to the delights of heterosexual sodomy we get the impression frank's perhaps a backdoor man here because he sings this number with absolutely salivating relish Interesting, the critic Robert Criscow has uh, uh, drawn attention to Zappa's fixation on buggery. And this is the album that gives us Jewish Princess. It's a wonderful uh, number, very un-PC, I have to say. But of course, he was uh, got into trouble with the Anti-Defamation League with charges of anti-Semitism, which brings about uh, him uh, releasing an equally offensive number, Catholic Girls, on Joe's Garage, uh, just a fraction later. As I said earlier, Zappa is no strange to musical pastiche, including on this album with the Peter Frampton reference. There's a track on this called uh, Wild Love, which alludes to Steely Dan, replete with marimbas, I have to say. Number two is Hot Rats from 1969. Zappa's works have been uh, largely described as a weird sonic artifacts, tapestries of sound and bizarre configurations. As regards this album, it's been described by Wikipedia as largely consisting of instrumental jazz influenced compositions with extensive soloing. Indeed it does, which sets it apart from those uh, those first or earlier Zappa albums, which focused a lot on um, uh, satirical vocal performances. This is a wonderful album of jazz fusion. You know, of course, you, you had Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, you had um, Soft Machine were doing wonderful things in this area. Uh, Santana even. But I think what differentiates this album from those guys is that this album has a lightness of touch to it. Um, Zappa's personality really does shine through the music. The overall musicality, musical chops displayed on this album is pretty impressive. But unlike those other records, uh, it doesn't 
um, it kind of implode in on itself. What Zappa does do on this album is he takes a leaf out of Miles Davis's book and he assembles some top-notch musicians and uh, ultimately what we get is a fine, fine album. Hot Rats is uh, Zappa's first solo album after Dissolving the Mothers. Lumpy Gravy, of course, which was uh, also a solo album, but uh, the Mothers were still in full flow at the time he did that record. This wonderful album starts off with the remarkable Peaches and Regalia, uh, which has that very uh, uh, tinkly, frothy feel to it. I don't like using the adjective frothy because it seems to suggest that the um, uh, the music has no substance, and that's certainly not what I'm saying. But it, it has. Uh, it comes down to what I was saying about that that uh, Zappa's personality, uh, very much um, imbued by this music. That's before we get that tubercular and lascivious rasp of Captain Beefheart on Willie the Pimp. Willie the Pimp, interestingly enough, was a, a song that resulted from Zappa interviewing a famous New York group he named Annie, if I'm not mistake, mistaken, sorry, whose story perfectly suited that lusty growl of Captain Beefheart and that uh, uh, blues-drenched violin. I think we say the tone is definitely set here. Son of Mr. Green Jeans, uh, again an instrumental. I think it's a reworking of the uh, Uncle Meat track. Um, and the gumbo variations are fascinating pieces with some excellent soloing from Ian Underwood and uh, Sugarcane Harris. On this, is what's interesting about this is uh, one critic has suggested that the music on the gumbo variations just whistles along uh, like a kettle or pressure cooker. Uh, maybe it's um, some sort of sonic pun on the jazz term cooking. And we get that wonderful lurid cover, which is just uh, uh, certainly arresting, shall we say. We get the, uh, it features Miss Christine of the GTOs looking like she's ready to devour you and spit out your bones. I don't know if it was just me, but it has uh, has uh, almost an apocalyptic feel to it as she's climbing out of that swimming pool. But there's no doubt about it. And those that are brave enough to do uh, a Zappa ranking video, considering the amount of albums he's got out, I can already anticipate uh, uh, the frothing rage in the comments because I haven't included such and such an album. But he's got so much, so many exceptionally good albums that it's very, very difficult to to really decide what to leave out. To be honest with you, but I think most most ranking videos would put this one in there somewhere if not right at the very top. Number one is One Size Fits All from 1975. Probably an odd choice for a number one Zapper album but I really dig this record. Uh, I just cannot stop listening to it. Uh, I just think it's absolutely marvellous. Again you know there's a lot of jazz fusion explored on this one. In fact Robert Criscow wrote that Zapper's music has gotten a little slicker rhythmically which is what happens when you consort with jazz guys. And the album is a slick album. Uh, perhaps not as much as Hot Rats uh, that employs that perfect balance of musical husbandry and wide-eyed uh, exuberance. This is one of those albums, uh, to quote Robert Criscow again, where he employs those stylistic barbarities and makes something absolutely remarkable. This is the lineup, of course, that would uh, uh, f uh, feature on the Live at, Live at the Roxy album, which is probably one of Zappa's finest uh, live albums, of course. This is just the studio albums. Enemy said of this album that it's an amalgam of funk riffs and heavy metal textures. But this is rather, I think, quite a reductionist critique of what this album actually is. I consider this to be the pinnacle of Zappiness. Uh, Brian Watson, to quote his wonderful book again, describes that as his most consummate cosmo-materialist statement. And his wonderful cover depicting a flow and eddy routine where, involving God, his girlfriend, Squat the Magic Pig and a sofa, we see the hand of God holding a cigar, a pastiche to the paintings of uh, Theodore Bry um, in this odd rather Zappa's depiction of the universe. In Zappa's world, the divine and the base grubbiness of human nature are sometimes indistinguishable. Uh, as I said, I think there's one philosopher said that uh, in order to understand human nature, you've got to reconcile yourself to the, the scum and the beauty that lies in every human heart. And this is certainly where Zappa seems to be coming from uh, a, lot of, a lot of the time, fueling his critiques of human behavior. There's a wonderful book. Um, in fact, the book Was God an Astronaut by Eric von uh, Daniken informs the narrative of the track Inca Roads. Can't afford no shoes is uh, Zappa critiquing the, that economic slump at the time, as well as pajama people where we see a side swipe on the vagaries of uh, musicians who perhaps took themselves way too seriously. It becomes an absurd polemic on the, on the fastidiousness of these kind of musicians with their flannel pajamas and their, their trap door at the back to uh, help release their movements. 
Florentine Pogan is named after a biscuit, according to Gail Zappra, after an incident that occurred in Australia. Perhaps the less said of that, the better. And Evelyn, a modified dog, to quote one critic, is uh, a track that continued Zappa's mystic, materialistic musings on the nature of musical resonance, hinting that music is a message from a sphere humans can barely comprehend. San Bedino is a, a track on here that everybody knows. It's a great rock number, I think. It draws an analogy of married life and the state incarceration. The album's title, One Size Fits All, uh, spells out uh, OSFA, which is an anagram of sofa, of course. And we get these sofa variations on here where God sings, and the German lyrics giving it a European Wagnerian texture. I really do love the cover of this album. It reminds me of a, a quote from Zappi himself where he said, when the illusion of freedom becomes too expensive to maintain, they will just take down the scenery, pull back the curtains, and you will see the brick wall at the back of the theatre. So that's my ranking of the top 10 albums of Frank Zappa, my personal favourites. I'd love to know what yours are. Do, do leave them in the comments below. So it just leaves me to say, I hope you're staying well and staying safe, enjoying the summer, uh, but more importantly, that you keep listening.